Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, this contributed session. Um, I think we can slowly start and uh, probably more participants will also um, show up. But um, my name is Carlos Kanders and I will chair the session. And uh, the main theme of the next one and a half hours will be the use of job and skills data, and in particular, the data on job vacancies. And all presenters will have 20 minutes to present their work, and I will give a signal when there are five minutes left for the presentation. And this will then be followed by 10 minutes for Q&A uh, for each talk. And if you have a question, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. And then I will invite you to ask it and, um, and uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, please note that uh, this session will also be recorded. And um, yeah, so I think with that, we can begin. And our first presenter will be uh, Julie, that's me, uh, from the OECD. Uh, so please, Julie. Thank you, uh, Carlis, for this uh, introduction. And uh, I would also like to thank the uh, organizer for uh, giving us a chance to uh, discuss our uh, work today. I hope you can all see my screen. I think it's working well now. So the paper I will uh, present today is uh, uh, called uh, Speaking the Same Language, a Machine uh, Learning Approach to Classify Burning Glass Skills. It's a joint work uh, with uh, two colleagues uh, from the OECD, uh, Luca Marcolin and Marike van de Beyer, and uh, uh, Benjamin Vignal from uh, MSI. So, so first, let me uh, give you a brief overview of uh, the data and the reasons uh, why we want to conduct uh, such a classification exercise. So at the OECD, we are using burning glass uh, data to better understand labor market dynamics and to inf inform public policy. So this data set, as you may uh, already know, contains information uh, retrieved from uh, online uh, job vacancies. And the data that we are uh, using uh, covers uh, six uh, Anglo-Saxon countries. So for uh, each uh, job posting, we have access to a, a wealth of uh, information, for instance, uh, the name of the employer, its location, the job title, uh, occupation codes, etc. And we also have access to requirements in terms of uh, education, professional experience and uh, skills. So this is very rich information and it can be used to study, for instance, uh, differences in skill demand over time uh, across sectors, uh, analyzing wage returns to different skills, etc. And uh, this data set has uh, actually been uh, used uh, in particular in the context of the Great Recession to uh, analyze the impact of the, cri uh, of the crisis uh, on uh, uh, skills uh, demand. So more specifically uh, uh, on the skills uh, information, so the data set uh, that we use contains more than 17,000 unique uh, skill uh, keywords. Uh, this is again uh, very rich information, however it's not very practical for empirical analysis that uh, usually required a much lower number of categories. Uh, in addition, uh, we see in the list of uh, the different keywords that uh, several uh, words are actually synonyms or very close concepts that should be uh, analyzed as such, and so that should be uh, grouped uh, together. So this is a case, for instance, of uh, teamwork uh, and um, communication. So we want to classify uh, keywords into a smaller number of categories based on their meaning. So as I mentioned, a number of researchers uh, have uh, already worked with the skill information uh, from uh, burning glass uh, data. Uh, for instance, uh, some uh, researchers, as Blair and Deming in uh, 2020, uh, use indirect uh, measures of skill requirements that are uh, the education and uh, professional experience uh, requirements. Other researchers have actually used uh, directly the skill information uh, contained in the, in the data. And so what they do is that they classify uh, the different uh, skill keywords into a, a restricted number of categories. So this is a case, for instance, of papers by uh, Lisa Kahn and co-authors and uh, the uh, paper by Deming and Noré in uh, 2020. So 
So usually in these papers, uh, the number of uh, categories uh, of skill categories that are analyzed range from two to 10. And for each uh, skill category, the authors need to list the different accepted keywords. To infer demand for one category, they uh, just count the number of uh, job ads listing at least one of the keywords uh, for this uh, skill uh, category. So the problem, the main problem uh, that we uh, have with this approach is that the researcher needs to specify uh, in advance exactly which categories are important or will be important in the future uh, in, the, uh, in the labor market and needs to list uh, all uh, uh, the accepted keywords uh, for the category. Um, we follow a similar approach in that we want to classify uh, the different skill keywords into a smaller number of categories. But the main difference uh, with respect to the existing literature is that we would like to classify all 17,000 keywords. And so for this, uh, we need a pretty exhausted a uh, uh, pretty exhaustive uh, list of uh, skill categories. So 10 categories uh, is not enough uh, for our uh, purpose. And this is why uh, we choose to uh, base our work on an existing uh, taxonomy. And I will uh, give more information on this existing uh, taxonomy uh, in the next uh, slide. So we base our approach on the meaning of the uh, skill keywords in burning glass and the meaning of the different categories. So again, the main uh, advantage of this approach is that we do not need uh, to specify uh, ex ante what are the important categories uh, of skills. The other advantage uh, are that we are able to use existing knowledge on skill concept and that we refer to a framework that is uh, validated and understood by uh, experts in the field, by statistical agencies, and uh, uh, so a framework that is stable uh, over time. We cannot perform this exercise uh, manually, and you will see in a second uh, uh, why. Um, so this is uh, why we develop a supervised uh, machine learning uh, algorithm to uh, perform this classification in an automatic way. So before uh, getting into more details uh, regarding the algorithm, I would like to uh, give you some explanation on two main uh, prerequisites uh, for this work. The first uh, preliminary step is to construct the tar target taxonomy or the final uh, taxonomy, uh, which are the final uh, categories uh, of skills. So we start uh, from uh, the ONET taxonomy. So ONET is a database on occupational uh, definitions developed by the US Department of uh, Labor with a clear uh, hierarchical structure uh, for skills, abilities, and uh, knowledge among other things. So we start from uh, this list of skills uh, from ONET. And we add some digital uh, skills categories, and we also merge some categories together uh, when they were too close in uh, meaning. So our final taxonomy, the list of uh, final categories, uh, contains 61 uh, categories. So if you believe this is still uh, too many uh, for some empirical analysis, and in particular for descriptive statistics, uh, we can always group uh, these categories ex post after the classification has been performed. So the second uh, prerequisite uh, for this work is to get the definitions uh, for uh, each skill keyword in the burning glass data. So I said the machine learning algorithm that we develop uh, will classify the skills based on their meaning. So we need the definition for each 17,000 uh, skill keywords. So we retrieve these definitions from ESCO uh, when available. So ESCO is the, Europe, um, the European equivalent of ONET. And it has the advantage that it contains the definition of several skills. And when uh, we cannot retrieve it from ESCO, uh, we scrap it from uh, Wikipedia. So now uh, the algorithm that we uh, rely on. So to uh, perform the classification uh, exercise, uh, we use uh, an algorithm that is called BERT. 
uh, that has been developed by researchers at uh, Google AI uh, very recently is still considered uh, to be a frontier in the field of natural language processing. And uh, it has been shown that it is uh, part, uh, performing particularly well uh, for tasks of uh, sentence classification. What is sentence classification? It's a classification of a, a group of text in terms of uh, spam or non-spam, or uh, to conduct a sentiment analysis, uh, for instance. So Bert, in a nutshell, uh, so the model has been pre-trained on a large corpus uh, of text. So this means that uh, we have access to a readily available word embedding. So here, a uh, little explanation of uh, what word embeddings are. So we want to uh, perform, we want to classify the skill keywords. So we want to uh, classify text into categories. We want to uh, perform mathematical operations with text. In order to do that, we need to transform the text into a mathematical object. And what is this mathematical object? It's a, a, a vector that will correspond to each word. And this is what we call word embedding, uh, you can uh, remember that word embedding is a vector representation of a word. So with the um, BERT model, we already, uh, for each uh, word in the English language, we have uh, access to a pre-trained vector uh, for this word, for, for each word. What the model will do in the, uh, in the second step is that the, the word vector uh, will be refined to take into account the context in which it appears and uh, to be tailored, uh, to be optimized in a sense uh, for the classification task. So the first step uh, in, this algorithm, in this algorithm will be to take a skill, to take a definition uh, for this skill and to attribute uh, word embedding, word vectors to each word in the sentence. The second step will be uh, to classify this definition uh, into one of the 61 categories. So this second step is uh, actually a pretty uh, standard uh, classification uh, exercise that is pretty well known in a machine learning uh, field. And uh, this classification is uh, done using a soft mask softmax classifier, which is very similar to a multinomial uh, logistic regression for those of you who are more uh, familiar with uh, econometrics. So in order to do uh, this uh, classification, to perform this supervised uh, machine learning approach, we need a, a training set. A training set is a, a label data set where we have manually attributed each skill keyword to uh, its correct category. So we take a subsample of our data, we attribute the correct category, and the algorithm will learn for this, uh, from these correct examples. So let me uh, 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 go through an example. So if we take uh, the uh, skill uh, keyword uh, marketing, for instance, so we take this keyword, we get the definition, so you see uh, the very first step is at the bottom of the graph. So we have the definition of marketing. The second step uh, is to uh, attribute one uh, word embedding for each word. Then the algorithm uh, process the information and transforms the word embeddings, uh, optimize the word embeddings to take into account the context in, in which it appears, so the sentence. And all this information is summarized in uh, one vector that is called C and that you see at the uh, left uh, of the figure. This is this vector that will be, uh, that summarizes all the information from the definition that will be classified with uh, the softmax uh, classifier. Once uh, the classification is uh, performed, it's a, prediction, it's a um, classical prediction exercise, actually, we get a vector uh, as an output with different values for uh, the different uh, skill categories, the 61 skill categories. And the predicted category by the algorithm is the one with the highest value 
uh, in this vector. So here, for instance, the highest value is uh, 0 0.86 uh, for the category sales and marketing. And so the algorithm predicts uh, that the skill keyword marketing should be classified uh, based on its meaning in the sales and marketing uh, skill category. Uh, usually you have uh, five minutes. Thank you. Uh, so if we apply this uh, algorithm to our uh, list of uh, different uh, keywords from uh, Burning Glass, uh, we are able to classify 17,331 uh, skills into uh, the 61 uh, categories. So we have a bit less than uh, 200 keywords that could not be classified. Uh, and this is the case because the definition was not available. We couldn't uh, retrieve the definition for this keyword. So the most populated, so, some descriptive statistics on the on the output, so the most populated categories are medicine and dentistry, management of financial resources, and uh, biology. So now, how can we judge uh, the quality of the algorithm? How can we evaluate the results uh, of the uh, algorithm? One typical measure is to look at the uh, accuracy uh, of the model. So this is the frequency of the model correctly allocating a skill uh, to, a, to a category. So what we do uh, is that we take uh, the uh, result from the algorithm and, that, and we compare uh, them against the test set, which is a data set composed of 150 uh, skills that we randomly draw uh, from the data set. And that, again, we manually classified into the different uh, categories. So we allocated the correct uh, category. So we compare the two uh, allocation and we uh, look at when the uh, model is correct and when it is not. So if we do that, we find that the accuracy measured on the test set is comprised between 74% and 90%. Uh, 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 so this means that the model is uh, correct uh, between 74% and 90% uh, of the cases. Uh, why do we provide an interval? Well, uh, we, uh, we, there are some skills for which the algorithm is more confident in its prediction. And we, when we filter uh, out the skills for which the model is less confident, we can reach higher levels of uh, accuracy. So this is uh, pretty, uh, pretty good, actually, uh, uh, given that in general, uh, the uh, BERT model applied to different uh, uh, problems achieves accuracies between uh, 65 and 95%. Uh, uh, it has also to be, uh, to be noted that uh, usually the, the model is tested for a much simpler problem than uh, this one. So that's the first way to assess internal validity. Now, a second way uh, to evaluate the results uh, is to conduct several uh, empirical uh, analysis and to compare the result that we obtain uh, with the taxonomy, with this classification, our own result, with other results uh, from the literature. So first, uh, we can look at differences uh, in uh, skill uh, requirements across sectors. Uh, and more specifically here, we look uh, at uh, digital intensive versus less digi digital intensive uh, sectors. And so in this graph, you can see that uh, jobs in uh, digital intensive sectors uh, require more frequently uh, communicate, uh, skills com uh, related to uh, communication. So this is what you have on the left of the graph. Uh, but also digital skills, uh, which is uh, not very uh, surprising, and uh, managerial and uh, cognitive uh, uh, skills. On the uh, contrary, uh, there are uh, jobs in um, digital intensive sector are less likely uh, to uh, require skills related to uh, medicine and uh, production, uh, for instance. So this is uh, very uh, consistent uh, with uh, economic intuition, and it's also uh, consistent with the uh, previous results uh, from the uh, economic literature. 
The second exercise uh, that we uh, can uh, that we can conduct is to uh, assess uh, whether certain skills uh, or certain uh, skill categories uh, exhibit uh, higher wage uh, premium than others. So in uh, this figure, you can see the estimated correlation between the hourly wage uh, posted in a job ad and the probability that this job ad required, requires at least one skill in each of the uh, skill categories, uh, holding other features of the job uh, constant. And so here you see that a number of skills exhibit a positive uh, wage premium. Uh, these are uh, skills related again to uh, management and cognitive skills. And on the contrary, uh, skills, uh, physical skills or language skills uh, and skills related to production uh, exhibit negative uh, wage uh, premium. So I'm going to stop here just to wrap up rapidly. Uh, what we wanted to do was to classify uh, skill keywords that appear in the burning glass uh, database into a smaller number of uh, categories based on the meaning of keywords and on the meaning of the categories. For this, we use uh, BERT, which is a natural language processes, uh, processing algorithm that is particularly suited for sentence classification. And the results of the classification exercise shows uh, satisfactory accuracy and a strong correlation with other trusted sources of information. Now, uh, what are the next steps? Well, we would like to uh, build on this work and uh, use a uh, classification uh, to analyze a uh, change in skill demand. And this is uh, work that will be uh, forthcoming uh, at the OECD. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm uh, looking forward uh, to your uh, questions. Thank you very much, Julie. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, so I'm looking at the Q&A box, and I think we haven't yet had a question. So please go ahead and and uh, submit your questions, and then I can um, I, I will I will select uh, the question and ask you to unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, state your name and affiliation and um, ask the question. So the floor is open. Um, so uh, we have the first question. Uh, Robin, would you like to, to ask it yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, thanks. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. I was just wondering, um, you're sort of basing all this analysis on the burning glass identification of skills from uh, individual job adverts. I just wondered if you've seen any analysis of, of sort of how good that identification is. You, you kind of pointed out some odd um, skills that get identified. Uh, have you done any work on that or, or seen any analysis of, of that part of the process? Um. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Robin, for this uh, uh, for this question. Uh, so indeed, uh, there are some uh, keywords uh, that are a bit uh, strange. Uh, so you, we see a lot of acronyms. Uh, we see uh, some uh, weird skills that are uh, that are demanded, uh, that are uh, posted in job ads. Uh, this can be the result of uh, burning glass uh, algorithm not uh, very uh, not parsing the text uh, well enough, or it can be uh, the fact that some uh, job ads uh, require uh, skills that are not uh, very common. Uh, that being said, uh, these instances, so anecdotal evidence, uh, let us uh, say uh, that these in instances are very rare. Uh, so usually the, uh, the skills that are not uh, widely accepted as such uh, are uh, appearing, uh, appearing in a, a small number of uh, job ads. Uh, so even if we are able to classify them, they will not uh, account for a large number of job postings, and so they will not uh, bias uh, any uh, further analysis. Um, I'm not aware of uh, works 
looking more specifically at the uh, reliability of uh, skills information. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're waiting for uh, an, another question. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that you looked at the uh, kind of definitions of these keywords in ESCO and then in Wikipedia. And I was just, I'm also working with ESCO and I was, I was curious, um, what was your experience working with ESCO and, and how many definitions did you find in ESCO and, and how many you had to again go and look for in Wikipedia? Yeah, so um, we were very satisfied with the definition that we found in ESCO. Uh, they are pretty much to the point. Uh, this is a database that is uh, that has been developed by experts. So uh, the definitions are uh, very good. Uh, that being said, it's true that uh, a lot of skills appearing, uh, appearing in uh, burning glass uh, cannot be uh, found in ESCO. Uh, so the majority uh, of the definition that we get uh, come uh, from uh, Wikipedia. This is the case because actually in the burning glass uh, database, uh, you don't only have skills, uh, you also have a lot of programming language, for instance, that you cannot find in ESCO. Uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, very technical uh, and specific skills uh, that will not appear in, uh, in ESCO. So yeah. the quality uh, of ESCO is good, but it's, uh, it needs to be augmented for sure. Less than a thousand uh, skills could be found in ESCO. I see. Um, we have a question from uh, Claire. Uh, would you like to go ahead, Claire, and ask? Um, yes. Uh... Thank you, Julie. That was very interesting. I was just curious, how many examples did you have in your training data? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, indeed, the, um, the quality of the training set is uh, pretty important to achieve a good uh, quality of the output. So we have, um, we have more than 300 uh, examples uh, in the examples in the, in the training set that we uh, classified manually. So we took some of the skills uh, randomly. Uh, we also included some uh, very frequent skills for which we wanted to be sure that the classification was correct. And we also had some uh, out of sample skills uh, in order to uh, better describe the different categories. So some categories uh, of the 61 categories uh, are pretty rare, and if we do not include these out of sample skills, uh, they would not be populated and they would be neglected by the algorithm. So, uh, this is why we had to add some other uh, keywords from expert knowledge. Uh, yeah, I hope you can answer the question. Um, and then we have another question from uh, Julia. Uh, would you like to go, go ahead? Hi, yeah, I was wondering how the BERT algorithm compares to the approaches that are being used by others to convert the text in job adverts to data. For example, the people at Nestor, Oxford, ONS, BEIS, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not sure I would compare um, BERT with other uh, natural language processing uh, algorithms in general, because this one is very specific uh, and has been developed to classify uh, the text. So usually you have, I mean, you have two steps. The first step is to transform words and text into vectors. And here you have a number of algorithms uh, that you can use. The uh, most uh, uh, famous one and the, the easiest uh, is called the uh, word to vec. And the second step that we do is that we have to classify. And actually, the BERT algorithm allows us to have this two step into an integrated model. So I'm not sure how I would uh, compare BERT with this uh, other algorithm, but I'm very happy to um, perhaps discuss further. Uh, uh, and if you can uh, let me know which algorithm in particular you have in mind, uh, I would be happy to, uh, to try and, uh, and be benchmark our model against uh, others. 
I think uh, I'm also a huge fan of taxonomies and it's, I think, a very fascinating topic, which we should definitely uh, maybe continue in the coffee break uh, yeah. after the session. Um, and uh, maybe we have one more minute. I, just a quick question. Will you release this taxonomy and also the keywords and the definitions? Um, is that a possibility? So, sorry, uh, can you... Can will you, will you uh, release, uh, you know, your taxonomy openly uh, with the keywords and definitions? Yeah, so uh, for now, it's still a, a work in progress. Um, we may uh, release it uh, for uh, public uh, use, but this uh, will have to be uh, cleared uh, within the organization first. And I, I guess it's going to be a bit uh, time consuming. Uh, but, uh, but as soon as we... Uh, we are allowed to, uh, we, we, we would uh, circulate. The paper, hopefully the paper will be available uh, in uh, some month okay. and uh, perhaps uh, the classification as well. But Thank you. Stay to get in touch if you are interested. Uh, we, can, uh, we can let you know. Thank you, Julie. And uh, thank you for answering thank all the questions. Much. And uh, now let's move on to our second speaker of the session, who will be Matthias Tian. Um, please, Matthias. Um, thank you very much. Um, so in this second part of this um, panel, we uh, I will present um, the work that's jointly with Abby Adams, um, Maria Bagova, and Tom Waters which is to use the same data set that we've previously used, which is the Bernie Glass data set, to study flexible work arrangements in low-wage jobs. So I myself, I'm a big data economist uh, focusing on the study of entrepreneurship and working with um, startups and the long startups. I've noticed one trend, which is the jobs created by startups over the present decade are of lower quality than the jobs created in the previous decade. And I'm not speaking of the specific salary offered by startups, but I was speaking about the non-wage characteristics and with trends of, um, for example, online mediated work as uh, a gig work, um, we have seen a decline in the quality of the jobs. An important function that firms play in the relation to workers is the uh, income smoothing, given that there are a number of shocks to the demand of the products and services um, provided. And um, with a traditional contract, which is a permanent full time, the worker wouldn't suffer income insecurity from these shocks. And with the lower quality jobs that we have observed to be more prevalent in the economy over the um, present decade, um, the income smoothing function um, and the risk sharing function between the firm and the employer has shifted. So that's a motivation for our um, present study. And um, this is driven by technological developments that have um, reduced the cost of offering alternative work arrangements. It's now easier than ever to provide workers with schedule flexible um, uh, co co contracts as well as to provide them with the actual schedule that they are working on to schedule uh, work on demand. Uh, we also have seen a substantial reduction in the need of co-location of workers if you compare the experiences of uh, people who kind of work through this pandemic with the opportunity of working from home, of convening for a conference online using Zoom with um, the experiences of uh, people who are living through earlier pandemics, it has been a much more kind of disruptive um, experience those, those the uh, previous centuries um, than it is in the most recent global pandemic. Uh, indeed, by some measures, uh, the structure of work is changing in the labor markets of uh, well-developed uh, countries. Um, so I've mentioned the gig economy before with the platform mediated work, which did see some challenge in the UK with the decision of the Supreme Court to reclassify the Uber workers as employees. And um, we also have the rise of zero hour contracts, which are contracts that do not guarantee a minimum number of hours and solo self-employment, which is a low, low income self-employment where um, you are often asked only working for a single firm, but you, you're not employed by the firm. Um, in a study from 2020, the authors found that um, recently only 55% of the jobs are the traditional types of jobs, which are permanent, full-time, nine to five jobs. And um, from the policymaking perspective, 
And there's a large interest in alternative work arrangements and flexible jobs uh, from the concern of wanting to help workers uh, and to avoid them being exploited. Um, as mentioned before, the um, role of firms to smooth the income for the workers, given uh, shocks to the demand of the products and services offered, um, is falling away. If firms can um, not pay the labor cost if they don't need um, as a, the labor because they have scheduled work arrangements. And um, furthermore, um, if a worker isn't classified as an employee, they can be ineligible for support schemes that are offered within companies. Um, so, and there is currently active debate among policymakers of how best to address um, this, the policy to support low income workers. And when we talk about schedule flexibility, it's not only um, lower quality, um, uh, like it, it is lower quality for lower income workers, but for higher income workers, um, particularly for families with children, schedule flexibility actually has been a big uh, plus. It helps with the work-life balance. It helps to balance um, the supervision um, requirements of uh, the children. And it helps to kind of smooth out domestic shocks that may arise. Um, we already know in the existing literature on schedule flexibility um, that um, the preferences of the workers for schedule flexibility um, are that most workers do not care about um, having a contract that offers flexibility. Only a small percentage share of the workforce cares about them, which are mostly female workers with children. And there already is extensive literature on uh, temporary jobs and part-time jobs. And when we started this project, we were very surprised about the, like the gap in the literature uh, on understanding schedule flexible jobs because very little research exists in this area. Um, empirical research has been held back by data and measurement issues. Um, there are surveys uh, here in the UK that ask about um, the prevalence of schedule flexibility. These surveys have suffered from um, changes in the questions that ask about schedule flexibility. So we do not have a consistent time series. Um, and um, the main labor force survey in the UK has uh, suffered from an under-recording of the zero hour contracts um, for which the um, ONS has apologized publicly in a letter. In this paper, uh, we use burning glass technology data for the United Kingdom. There are 46 million job vacancies posted um, from 2012 onwards. We find that the data is more reliable uh, from 2014 onwards, so we only use 2014 to 2020. Um, our process is to manually annotate 6,500 vacancies. This is taking a lot of time and we work kind of a large team of annotating these vacancies because to make sure the quality is good, we annotated every vacancy twice and to make sure that uh, we agreed on the annotations. And we uh, manually flagged um, the uh, flexibility and um, whether a vacancy is salaried or not, which means whether it's hourly pay or kind of annual, uh, like monthly pay based on annual salary uh, and permanent and uh, full time. So these are the dimensions that we consider. Um, the literature using online job vacancy data is exploding. It's really, really big. And um, the previous work is, is another great example of the phenomenal work that has been um, done in this area. Um, the areas covered range from wages, skills, COVID-19, technology and competition. This is another five, five main areas where the use of online job vacancy data has made a real difference in our understanding of um, the labor market. Um, the kind of literature is slowly making its way into the top journals. There are like two top three econ journals and um, papers that uh, that made it into um, the top three journals. Um, and then there are four top field journals and was kind of the most, uh, um, most represented author in the already published journals is Lisa Kahn and that she has um, a number of highly cited papers in this area. In this paper, we use this new data source to better understand the firm demand for flexible work arrangements. And we ask the following questions. The first is how prevalent um, is um, the offering of uh, flexible jobs? How has uh, the offering changed 
over time for flexible uh, for schedule flexibility what are the other job characteristics that correlate with uh, flexibility and how do uh, the characteristics of firms and of local labor markets um, affect the rate of schedule flexibility which we observe and um, we now move to the next section which is the discussion of uh, the data set and um, the first step and we define a schedule flexibility schedule flexibility is any arrangement in which the timing of work is not fixed in the contract and has been agreed at a later date between the employer and the employee. And in a practice, we characterize a job to be schedule flexible um, if it mentions a shift or rota work without a fixed uh, pattern, offers flexible working hours, and specifies that work will be organized according to the needs of the business. So these are kind of the key concepts that we will have been looking for when we're extracting schedule flexibility from the manually annotated job ads. Um, an important distinction with schedule flexibility, which kind of affects the quality of the, of, of the work is, if it's um, salary schedule flexibility, that's actually um, a high quality uh, job, right? Because uh, you know as a worker the income that you will receive and you can adjust the hours flexibly um, while kind of having certainty about the income. Um, the uh, lower quality uh, um, contract is a uncertain income uh, contract where you have schedule flexibility, which affects um, how much take home pay you will receive and where the take home pay is linked to the number of hours that you are working. So that's a more problematic um, case of schedule flexibility from a policymaker perspective. In the job ad data, uh, we um, measure um, the schedule flexibility from the full vacancy text. So we can read um, the, the full vacancy, which usually has average lengths of, in the UK, around 400 words. And um, there are um, limitations to this approach. Um, so we rely on burning glass, which is um, as the OECD, uh, which is the same source that the OECD is also using in their kind of large organization. And burning glass is considered to be the market leader in this area, and they do have very careful cleaning of the data. Also, the data isn't perfect. When you kind of read through the vacancies, you will at, at times notice um, some duplicate uh, job ads that haven't been deduplicated um, through their systems. Um, but these technical limitations, notwithstanding, there are also limitations that not, not all um, jobs are advertised online, although we have, and um, we believe, a share of over 90% of job ads that are now advertised online, and 10% are not advertised online. And the jobs posted online have a tilt towards professional jobs, and um, they miss wage information quite often. And we do use the wage information in our study. Um, although, as a positive point, um, in the US, wage information is listed with a much lower frequency than in the UK. So because we're using wage information, UK is actually tends to be more reliable as a data source. And um, then um, there can be a difference between what a firm states in the job ad and what the employee achieves in the subsequent negotiations with the employer. So we actually don't, don't, don't know the outcome of the negotiation. We only observe what the firm has advertised in the job advert. We then also take a supervised machine learning approach. We looked at the BERT algorithm. In this case, BERT didn't improve the performance. So we thought, OK, let's use the simplest model. Um, and one of the simplest supervised machine learning approaches for a classification problem is the logistic regression model, because most of the economists have come across this when they studied, um, when they studied um, econometrics in the courses. So we follow four steps. The first uh, labels the 6,500 the job vacancies to identify the dimensions of work that are mentioned in the vacancy text. We then um, use a, a vocabulary of the most frequent words. We use 5,000 words. Um, because of the logistic regression um, model, we actually didn't need it to convert the text into word vectors. We could have done that, but um, it's not necessary. So we use a much simpler approach of having uh, count vectorizers, which essentially just counts if a word appears in the text or not within the vocabulary that we consider. So it's a back of word approach where we not even consider the sequence of the word, right? And um, if, um, if there are two sentences that have the same words, but where the words appear in different sequence, we wouldn't consider them, we would consider them to be the same sentence. And uh, we use um, uh, one, two, and three grams 
um, within the count vectorizer, which means that uh, we use a single word, we use uh, two subsequent words, or up to kind of three words in sequence um, to do the classification problem. And once we have trained the logistic classification model using the examples that we provide to the algorithm, we then use the algorithm uh, on the rest of the previously unseen vacancies, on the rest of the uh, 50 million vacancies, such that for all of the 50 million vacancies, we extract the contract type uh, that is mentioned in the job vacancy. Uh, Matthias, you have um, five minutes. Oh, thank you. Perfect. That's, uh, that's perfect. Uh, thanks for the reminder. Um, then um, some example of the text that describes schedule flexibility. So here you have assess as a bank position to provide cover as and when we need it such as for annual leave and sick leave, the hours and days you work will vary. Another example is the sentence at hard working, which allows flexibility in choice. And the most important benchmarks that we have for such an approach is to benchmark our machine learning model to a keyword-based model. Right? And for schedule flexibility, which is in the first row of this table, um, if you compare the F1 score, which is uh, the geometric mean of the precision and the recall, um, you see that we have 18.5% improvement of the F1 score, which is a substantial improvement. It's not perfect, and um, it's not as high as we, as we want it to be, but schedule flexibility is uh, used in a lot of different linguistic contexts, such that it's actually difficult to uh, determine schedule flexibility, even for humans at times. And we have, length, we have had lengthy discussions when we were doing the manual annotations, if a vacancy is schedule flexible or not. Um, great. So now the most interesting results, I'll blitz through them in the remaining four minutes. So we have key, uh, like eight key facts that I'd like to present here. The first key fact is that about 30% of jobs advertised are flexible. And right? so the prevalence of flexibility is 30%. And the most prevalent type of flexibility is a non salary flexibility has a prevalence of around 15% in 2019. And um, the second fact is, and um, there's more flexibility in the poorer regions. Um, so that's to the west of Wales, Northern England. There's less flexibility in the areas around London, which are more wealthy. And um, fact number three, um, over the last uh, six, seven years, the share of schedule flexibility has doubled. So that um, shows kind of urgency for the policymaker to address this challenge, given that um, employers have found it to be attractive to offer schedule flexible vacancies. Fourth, um, we find more flexibility um, in low wage jobs. So here you see a chart that presents different wage bins and the proportion of job ads that follow since this wage bin that are schedule flexible. And you see that for the lowest wage bin, there's the highest proportion of schedule flexibility and it decreases as we increase the wage bin. Correspondingly, um, if we look at the ranking of occupations, those rank very highly like managers and professionals only have a low proportion of flexibility. And if you look at what type of flexibility this is, it's usually a good type of flexibility where you have income security, while the lower rank occupations from elementary process operatives and services exhibit much higher shares of schedule flexibility. Fact number six is that if you consider the characteristics that are correlated with schedule flexibility, we find that um, when we look at um, non salaried um, jobs which are paid by the hour, um, is that there is um, more flexibility than uh, non flexibility. And if we look at temporary jobs, then there is more flexibility than um, non-flexibility. Um, fact number seven considers uh, companies, right? We differentiate between low wage and high wage companies. And we do find the significant effect that if a company is a low wage company, then both the low wage and high wage jobs that they post have a higher proportion of schedule flexibility. So the characteristics of the company that's offering the wage also matters. And finally, the last fact is regarding the employer concentration. So we look at um, the proportion of, um, uh, of vacancies posted by, by large employers using the Heffendahl index for a local labor market. And uh, when we residualize both the concentration measure as well as the schedule flexibility measure, you can see um, a strong 
uh, correlation between the employer concentration with schedule flexibility, which we interpret as the increased bargaining power of employers. If they have increased bargaining power because there's high employer concentration, they tend to use the bargaining power to offer more schedule flexible work that is advantageous to the firms because firms do not have the income smooth um, when there is a shock to the demand. Great. So uh, to conclude, um, we extract information on the contract terms from burning glass job vacancy text to analyze um, a firm demand for uh, flexible work arrangements. Uh, we find that flexible work arrangements are disproportionately represented in low uh, wage, lower skilled, non salaried, also low wage counties, low wage companies, and in counties where um, there's high employer concentration. And finally, uh, this is ongoing work. We're still trying to understand the drivers of a schedule flexibility and ultimately also to suggest uh, what policymakers can do to limit the harm of the rise of schedule flexibility to low wage workers. Thank you very much, Matthias, for a very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, the floor is now open for questions. Um, please submit them in the Q&A box and I will um, ask you to then unmute yourself and uh, perhaps state your affiliation and then ask your question. Um, I guess while we wait for the questions, uh, I was curious, you mentioned that you, you labeled a large amount of uh, jobs, like six and a half thousand. And I was wondering, uh, I'm just curious, uh, did you use uh, some platform for doing this or some specific tool? So how do you go about that's, it? That's a great question. In fact, we have developed the bespoke annotator uh, on burning glass on other projects, but for this project, as it was the first project that we did in Oxford, we actually used Excel. <laughs> so we had in one column the full vacancy text, and then we had lots of columns for the different contract types, <laughs> and uh, we, we put in a zero if it was uh, not present, and put in one if the specific contract type is present. Yeah, it's a classic approach. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I guess. I guess while we wait for, for another question, um, I can, I can, uh -huh, we have a question from Julia. Uh, Julia, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm not sure if I misinterpreted what you were saying, but uh, can you just clarify, you mentioned shift work and I just wanted to check, was all shift work classified as flexible? Um, that was that is ambiguous. So for for each vacancy, um, so our starting point is whenever there is a frequent change in the schedule, um, where that is not ex ante agreed upon, um, we consider this as schedule flexibility. If this is shift work where the hours are specified in the uh, contract. And then as uh, in job vacancy, we wouldn't consider it as schedule flexible. If that is shift work where there is a frequent subsequent negotiation between the employer and the worker, we do consider it as schedule flexibility, uh, schedule flexible. And um, there is a lot of ambiguity on this in the vacancy text, and we try to use the best of our judgment in long discussions to then say um, if we then decided. And um, if it is schedule flexible or not, and as we publish the paper, we make the training data set available. And then and you can also check uh, within the annotated data set the rules that we follow. Thanks. Um, I think it's really great that you have published the data set. And um, uh, yeah, we have a question from Robin. Um, Robin, yeah. please go ahead. Uh, hi there. Um, thanks for that talk. Uh, you, you mentioned um, the employer concentration uh, and that correlating with uh, flexibility. I wondered if you could talk a bit more about how that employer concentration definition worked and what sort of what level of geographical unit you used for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we use counties. So we consider um, job postings in counties. And um, we then see for um, the county, we exclude the largest employer, which is the NHS, because it's so big. Uh, it's such a big proportion of all jobs in the UK are posted by the NHS. And uh, we exclude um, uh, companies that only post a single um, job ad in the period that we consider. 
and um, then um, within the county, we, we then look at um, the number of job postings by firm and then uh, use the Heffendahl measure for employer concentration. So the Heffendahl measures looks at the proportion of job ads posted by firm and then squares that proportion and then sums, sums it up. Um, so that's a standard measure for concentration that we have. And um, so the, the paper uses a um, uses uh, both a uh, number of fixed effects, including occupation time quarter fixed effects, uh, county time quarter fixed effects, and occupation county fixed effects. And we also use instrument variables, um, like the shift chair variables, um, to um, address potential concerns for homogeneity um, in the relationship between employer concentration and um, the um, scaling flexibility prevalence in a county. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm curious about the definition, again, about the flexible uh, jobs. And uh, as you mentioned that you had these discussions and uh, now, now with kind of COVID-19 and all, um, I'm just curious if also working from home is also could be regarded as, as, as part of me working as, as a, a flexible arrangement or, or did you somehow, or do you think that, um, this, well, I guess it also could count as work from home, but I guess in the job ads, do you see how, how, how um, employers are using the word flexible? Could it also sometimes relate, for example, to work from home? That's a great question. Um, so we did the annotations before COVID-19 started. So you, this, like, this thing was academic papers in economics as they drag on for a long time. <laughs> and we hope to publish it soon, and, but it's already you know, two years in the making. Um, at that time, we had, like uh, working from home is very rare. Right? We do see a massive increase in job ads that offer working from home um, since the pandemic started. Okay? So it would be interesting to see if it, if it, if it will stay. Um, just uh, offering a vacancy as working from home wouldn't make it schedule flexible, right? Because uh, you can work from home, but you can work nine to five. You can um, be like working in a call center, but not sitting in the call center, but sitting in front of your laptop at home and then taking the calls. Um, so uh, what we tried to do was to really get at the schedule and get at um, when the schedule is negotiated. Um, and um, not all job ads have a discussion of this, but uh, um, we, we found quite a large proportion of job ads do have a discussion on this. And um, you're absolutely right. We stopped our um, sample to, uh, beginning of 2020 because this work from home would just kind of potentially mess up the language that's used to characterize schedule flexibility. So we stopped the paper analysis in January 2020 um, just to avoid um, the like, massive change in the language that is used within job ads to characterize contractual arrangements. So, so I guess um, also relating to uh, Julie's question in the chat, um, this sounds like a follow-up study that you might carry out about the COVID impact on flexibility. That's, that's a great suggestion. And there's this anecdote of um, you had like the financial crisis, and then you can see the effect of the financial crisis on the papers that cover financial crises. You have like a modest dip. With COVID-19, you have like no study on pandemics. And with, since COVID-19 started, this like explosion of studies that cover COVID-19. So at the moment, there's a bit of a COVID-19 fatigue. Um, within the research community that kind of would, in the UK, we're exiting the lockdown. And we're kind of wanting to put everything that's behind us in like a bad year. So um, my wife actually had a submission to the Lancet, which was rejected, unfortunately. And then the answer, the, the reason was we have too many COVID-19 papers. Please do not resubmit this to any of our sub journals because we do not want to cover COVID-19 anymore. So it seems to be a difficult area right now to get into kind of publishing a paper in a highly ranked journal that covers COVID-19 because we've read so many of these articles over the past year. I see, it's, it's almost sorry to hear. Like, yeah. um, well, uh, thank you, Matthias, for, for um, the presentation about a very important topic and also answering all the questions. And I will now um, pass the, the duty of uh, chairing to Julie and uh, start sharing my screen. Yes, exactly. So now we have a, a presentation by our chair, uh, Carlis Kanders from uh, Nesta. Uh, he will present work uh, on uh, mapping uh, career causeways, supporting workers at risk. 
So Carlis, you have uh, uh, 20 minutes, as you know, and uh, I will let you know uh, after 10 minutes, if you please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my slides. And um, thank you also to the organizers for inviting uh, me and Nesta to present the Mapping Career Causeways project. Now, some of you might already be familiar with Nesta, but for the benefit of those who are not, let me just spend a, a minute on introductions. So we are the UK's innovation agency for social good. And our purpose is to design, test and scale new solutions um, to society's uh, biggest problems. And um, we have just updated our strategy and now we are aligning our efforts behind three innovation missions, working to first uh, reduce childhood inequalities and promote a fairer start. Secondly, to promote a healthy life uh, by tackling the obesity and loneliness epidemics. And thirdly, to build towards a sustainable future. And as part of this uh, third sustainable future mission, Nesta is also working on uh, innovations that improve labor market information and support those who have lost work in finding roles that use their skills and talents. And so as well as supporting economic recovery, this work um, program aims to tackle skills mismatches and help, hence help uh, boost UK's productivity growth. Um, so this brings me to uh, the Mapping Career Causeways project, which was carried out by uh, the team that you can see here, and which was funded by JP Morgan as part of their New Skills at Work uh, initiative. Now, I should make a disclaimer that in this particular work, we haven't uh, yet utilized online job postings data, but we have used other open uh, data sets that I will talk about in a minute. And uh, that said, you will definitely be able to appreciate um, how data on job vacancies could further extend and enrich um, our approach. Uh, so we started this project before COVID-19 um, kind of took over everything. And so the focus of this project was to support workers whose jobs are at risk of being automated by machine learning algorithms. And specifically, we were interested in identifying in a data-driven way how these workers could build on their existing skills and experience and ultimately to transition to more secure jobs, jobs that are less likely to experience technological disruption. And then uh, the second name was uh, broader, which was to develop a general methodology for measuring the resilience of workers to various types of economic shocks that we also include, for example, um, the COVID-19. And so uh, we have already released a report and also a shorter user guide where we describe our approach and key findings. Um, and you can find those on our website. But um, in this talk, I will provide a brief overview of the project, and then I will show you some key aspects of the methodology and uh, findings. And I will also touch upon very lightly on some of the next steps that we have taken since publishing the report. So at a glance um, through this work, we have uh, kind of built a map of occupations that can help to identify potential pathways from high risk to uh, safer occupations. And uh, the crucial step here was to measure the similarities between over one and a half thousand different occupations based on their skills, uh, work activities, and also more broader um, interpersonal, physical, and structural uh, work features. And on the right-hand side, you can see a visualization of this map where each dot is an occupation and their placement in the map depends on their similarity to other occupations. And so occupations that have similar skills are naturally grouped together and we can find uh, different clusters. For example, a cluster related to sales and services workers. And there we can find occupations such as um, highlighted here, like hotel concierge or ticket sales agent. And then uh, a bit higher, you can see uh, another occupation, uh, the uh, digital media designer, which is in between the ICT and media clusters, reflecting the requirements of both types of skills in this job. Now, as the next step, we can overlay the risk of automation over this map with the red color indicating high risk and the blue color a low risk. And specifically, we are measuring how suitable are these tasks, um, are the tasks in these jobs for machine learning. And I'll explain a bit more how exactly we did it in a minute. Um, and so looking at this, you can immediately appreciate that the automation risk uh, concentrates in clusters in this occupational landscape. And for example, you can see a red cluster in the sales and, and services uh, sector, 
um, and in uh, and another cluster in the business administration sector. And so one clear takeaway from this is that the closest transitions for at-risk workers will not necessarily be automation safe. And so at-risk workers who might be displaced by the technological change will have to make um, large leaps, potentially large leaps to reach safer occupations. And indeed, we can, we can see that when we measure the number of uh, viable and desirable transitions that each occupation has to other more secure jobs. And this is indicated here by the size of the different circles. And uh, we used a conceptual framework set out by previously by experts from the World Economic Forum and also OECD, where a viable transition is one which is a good fit in terms of uh, skills and work characteristics. And uh, desirable transitions have at least a similar level of uh, compensation. And so you can appreciate just from this map that the range of transition options varies widely across occupations and uh, depends on the worker's position in the map. Now, um, uh, you can also um, explore this data visualization uh, yourself, which is also published on the website. And let me just demonstrate also how the information underpinning this map then uh, can be used to explore further a specific workers' career uh, paths, uh, potential career paths. So um, let me just go to the website. And so here um, you can see an example of a shop assistant where we have identified 50 job roles that might be uh, viable transitions. So meaning that they kind of have a similarity to the shop assistant, which uh, crosses a certain threshold, which I'll explain in a minute. And um, we can zoom in and we can find the 15 most viable transitions. We require the most similar skills and, and work activities and, and uh, also have comparable work context features. And then, um, so we can kind of look at uh, which occupations are most similar. And so in this case, those would be kind of more to the right-hand side. For example, um, so a sales assistant or a specialized seller. And um, then we can also break down the similarity into the different aspects that we measured, like for example, the work activities or the specific skills. And then we can also look at other important um, parameters of, a, of an occupation. For example, the average annual earnings, which um, uh, so are shown here uh, for a shop assistant with a blue line, dashed line, and then we can compare the earnings of shop assistant with um, other occupations and identify which ones are the more desirable uh, destination occupations. And then um, we can also, of course, uh, we want to kind of con like uh, focus on the uh, automation risk of the destination occupations. And this is shown here um, with, the, with the colors. And um, as already we kind of established the closest transitions for the shop assistant who, who is at risk of automation uh, itself. Uh, so the closest transitions will also be at, at high risk and we see it here. And so what we can do is uh, swap these occupations out and instead um, add other occupations that are at a lower risk. And uh, such as, for example, we find like ICT help desk agent or, or more managerial uh, positions like the shop manager. Um, then we can also do a similar analysis uh, for COVID, uh, for the impact from the COVID-19, which we uh, estimated using an experimental measure where we look at the proximity uh, to other people and also uh, whether you have to work on the site. And then um, you can see, for example, that also some occupations are, have a particularly high exposure, like for example, the tanning consultant, which might not be a good transition option at the present moment. Um, and then we can again swap these occupations out for something else. And then finally, we can also go one step further. We can ask the question, uh, what if I acquire a new skill? And so we can add this skill to the occupation skill set and recalculate the similarities uh, to the other occupations and find new transitions that have become viable. And so by, by doing this, um, you see that we have a few more transitions that appear on this list, like for example, a office manager or advertising uh, assistant. And so in this um, way, we think that, you know, like this kind of approach um, can broaden a worker's career horizons and also allow us to kind of measure the, um, the resilience of workers by, by looking at their kind of trans, um, destination occupations um, and, and, and the number of these destination occupations that are kind of available to them. So, this is kind of um, at a glance. And so let me now go and explain a little bit 
on the methodology of, uh, of the work. So, of course, you, you can find kind of, the, you, of course, you will find like all the details in the report. Let me just kind of breeze through the, the methods and then also give you some highlights from the, from the key findings um, from the report. So overall, the project had three main steps. And first, we measured the risk of automation uh, for European occupations. And we did this by using automation estimates that were developed by Brynjolfsson, Mitchell, and Rock in a study from 2018. Uh, and there they estimated the suitability for machine learning for thousands of tasks uh, that are specified in a United States occupational information network, um, which is known as ONIT. And we translated these estimates to occupations specified in the European um, skills, competencies, qualifications, and occupations framework, uh, which is uh, known as ESCO. And for this purpose, we had to develop the first uh, direct crosswalk between uh, the American and European frameworks. And then in the second part of the project, we aim to shift the focus from, uh, from the occupations of the actual workers whose job is at risk. And so there we used a EU labor force survey to identify demographic patterns for three countries, for the UK, France, and Italy at the national and regional levels. Now, um, in this graph, you can see all the analyzed ESC occupations along two dimensions of automation. On the x-axis, you can see the overall automation risk. Uh, and in line with the original study by Brynjolfsson and colleagues, um, we measured it uh, as the average of automation scores across all the job tasks. And then uh, the tasks were weighted by their importance. Also, on the y-axis, you can see a novel measure of automation that shows the prevalence or the proportion of tasks that are automation bottlenecks, meaning that they are especially difficult to automate. And so we, didn't, we distinguished a group of occupations that are uh, that we deem to be at high risk, shown here in uh, red color, that have both a high average overall automation risk and a low prevalence of bottleneck tasks. And so some examples here include uh, the hotel concierge or medical transcriptionists or investment clerks. And generally the typical high risk occupations were uh, sales and services jobs or clerical business and administration occupations and financial associate professional jobs. And then the third. You have, you have uh, eight minutes. Ah, thank you, Julie. Um, and then the third and essential part of the project was to build a career transitions recommendation algorithm to find transitions from the at risk occupations to their safer jobs. And so by joining up the European and American official occupational databases, we had uh, detailed occupational profiles for the almost 3,000 occupations listed in the ESCO uh, database. And so here is an example of the data that we use for recommending the job transitions. So ESCO forms sort of the foundation of this uh, approach. And we use the 1600 top level occupations in the ESCO hierarchy. And then we use their 13,000 uh, skills, knowledge, attitudes, and values that also Julie uh, mentioned uh, in her talk. And then um, you can see some of the skills that the hotel concierge has um, also at the bottom of this, of this slide. For example, identify customers' needs or greet guests. And in addition, we also used ESCO skills hierarchy, which groups skills into categories related to work activity types. Then from on it, we imported uh, work, work context features. So these describe uh, things like how much you need to use a telephone or do face-to-face -face discussions, or how much freedom you have to make deci decisions, and also things like how much time you need to spend sitting or exposed uh, to weather outdoors. And so these kind of describe the job at the more kind of coarser uh, level. And then another parameter we used from ONIT was their job zones, uh, which described the level of preparation that uh, a worker might need in the occupation. So it is measured between one and five, where one means there is almost preparation needed. For example, if you want to work as a, as a dishwasher, and then job zone five would be occupations that need extensive preparation, like for example, judges or doctors. Um, and then finally for earnings, we used information in the ASH tables, the UK's annual survey of hours and earnings, then of course, we also use our automation risk estimates and uh, to estimate the impact from COVID-19, we used um, uh, remote labor index, which was developed by researchers from Oxford. So uh, just very briefly, so in terms of comparing occupations, we developed four similarity measures. 
and uh, uh, for comparing the essential occupation, essential optional occupational skill sets, we use natural language processing and calculated sentence embeddings of their skills descriptions. And Julie already gave a really nice introduction of what embeddings are. And so we compared them and found the best pairwise skills matches between both occupations. And we call this the NLP adjusted overlap. And then for the work activity types and work context features, we also created uh, sort of feature vectors and, and measured their alignment. And then we aggregated these four measures by simply averaging them. And you can see on the right-hand side kind of the most similar uh, destination, destination occupations for uh, just these four examples. And overall, the results um, kind of were um, satisfactory. But then we also wanted to establish a threshold value for the similarity measure, which could distinguish between a viable and, and viable transition. And so we did this by calibrating the similarity measure by using the ESCO occupational hierarchy. And we assume the transitions within the same ESCO uh, four digit group should be viable. So for example, halal butchers, kosher butchers, meat cutters, they're all in the same ESCO four digit group. And so it's reasonable to assume that the transition between these occupations should be viable. And so we um, measured the within group similarity for all ISCO four digit groups. And you can see the distribution of these within group similarities on the right hand side. And interestingly, there's quite a bit of variation. For example, different driving instructors uh, are very similar, whereas armed forces occupations are the most dissimilar. And so we use this distribution to define a viability threshold, which is shown here with the red line. Um, and so Finally, once we have the viable transitions, um, we also look for the earnings, find the desirable transitions, and then look at the automation risk, which uh, uh, then would define even a smaller subset of the safe uh, destination occupations. So at a high level, this is how it works. And um, importantly, all of this is built using fully open sort of tools and, 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 and code. And so, um, and, and it is kind of based in the very granular ESCO um, framework of uh, occupations and skills. So now let me just use the remaining of time of, uh, to kind of breeze through some of the um, uh, highlights from the report's findings. So as we already established in the, in the kind of uh, introduction, um, there's a, there, we saw a strong localization of automation risk in the occupational landscape. And so although the risk of automation varies across occupations, um, jobs that require similar skills tend to face similar levels of risk, which probably is not really surprising, but really underscores that at-risk workers face the challenge of finding a job that is sufficiently similar so that, um, to their current role, so that it is a viable transition, but also sufficiently dissimilar so that the worker has a lower risk of automation. Um, also, we saw that the distribution of risk across occupations really exacerbates the disparity between high risk and lower risk jobs. So the high risk occupations have an average 49% uh, less desirable transition options when we rule out transitions that would push the worker into another high risk occupation. And so basically these occupations tend to concentrate in clusters. And so for the worker to um, find a safer occupation, they kind of need to escape their cluster and so forego many of their maybe most readily available uh, transition options. Now, interestingly, we also found a large variation across the different high risk occupations, with the number of safe and desirable transitions varying between zero for some occupations to more than uh, 100 for others. And on the right hand side, you can see some examples of occupations with the least and most transition options. And so what this means is that some at risk workers will need more support than others. And so in, in terms of the major occupational groups, um, the occupations with the greatest number of transitions are managers, professionals, and technicians, whereas elementary, clerical, and services and sales workers have the smallest number of transition options, um, so safe transition options. And interestingly, there is also a considerable variation even among occupations belonging to the same ISCO four-digit group. And just one example um, I wanted to highlight is transport clerks, where we found no safe and desirable transitions for rail traffic controllers, but then we found five such transitions for taxi controllers and 10 for water traffic coordinators. And so of course, the difference between these occupations are in their skill sets and sort of in terms of how heavy the occupation is in communication or collaboration activities, or also are there some sort of organizing and planning and scheduling skills involved. And so, um, you know, by using this detailed like ISCO framework, we can really start kind of distinguishing these differences, which I think is really interesting and which would remain hidden if you would just stay at the three or four digit level of, of ISCO. 
which is kind of usually that was the case. Um, and then finally, just one last uh, point uh, on this is that we also find that high risk workers with less training and work experience generally have lower mobility. So the difference, for example, between job zone, um, between work, so between uh, occupations that require sort of um, the job zone two and job zone three, the difference is twofold between the median uh, number of transitions. And then the difference between job zone two and job zone four is already fourfold. So there's quite a big difference. And interestingly, the number of transitions is positively correlated with each of the three factors that underpin the job zone parameter, namely the level of education, related work experience, and on-the-job training. And so it seems that all avenues of training, either to experience or education, appear to be associated with better worker mobility. And then uh, one final point, which is uh, that we also uh, characterized um, uh, kind of this, the skills, the skills gaps that are uh, in these transitions. And um, I think, uh, so kind of what is really nice about um, the kind of using the natural language processing approach and using the embeddings, we can also kind of uh, look at the partial overlaps between different skills when we compare the skill sets. So in this example, I'm just showing you the shop assistant occupation and um, a transition to visual merchandiser who is responsible for the visual display uh, of goods in a shop. And so of course we can see the perfect overlaps of skills, so the skills that both uh, occupations already have. But then in yellow, I also highlighted skills that have partial overlaps so that they have uh, semantic similarity, which is sufficiently high, uh, but, is not, uh, but they're not uh, the same skills. And just some nice examples that you can detect in this way is, for example, in the row number two, uh, supervising merchandise displays and coaching team on visual merchandising. And so there is some relation between, um, uh, between the, the merchandising uh, sort of area. And also in row number four, we have identified customers' needs being matched with layers with appropriate staff for visual displaying. So both skills have to do something with that kind of communication um, and understanding um, the needs of other people. And then also we can, uh, which is nice is also that we can rank these, um, these skills at the destination occupation in terms of their semantic similarity to the origin skill set. And uh, at the bottom of this list, uh, you might find skills that are uh, likely to be the least familiar for the origin occupation. And so would constitute kind of the largest skills gaps. And we, really, we see that in this example, these skills like to interpret floor plans or conduct research on trends in design. So these are really uh, specific to the visual merchandiser occupation. So um, just to tie it all together. So um, we think that this work has the potential to help policymakers, careers advisors, employers, and individuals to prepare for the changing labor market. In particular, we have highlighted three use cases. Uh, number one, to recommend job transitions by identifying viable and desirable transitions. Number two, to support workers at risk by mapping the impact of shocks. And then finally, to also provide skills recommendations in terms of which skills are required to move between two jobs or also what upskilling opportunities might be the most uh, kind of effective. And so in terms of the next steps, so we have some uh, new projects um, in, uh, in the works to deliver open and up-to-date insights in UK skill demand. So uh, here the idea is that we scrape our own job adverts and then develop algorithms to process this data, uh, including also detecting skills uh, in these adverts and then publishing this, uh, these insights also openly. And then also we, we have uh, some project in works to also research green jobs and green skills. And then just the very last thing, I wanted to highlight is a very interesting data set that we have already collected and uh, published since uh, the report. And this is, uh, these are crowdsourced feasibility ratings from almost 400 participants on a subset of the job transitions between ESCO occupations. And um, so these are, uh, the, uh, we, so we collected uh, transitions for the, the ratings for a subset. Then we extended these ratings uh, to all of the transitions using a supervised machine learning approach. And these ratings reflect uh, sort of a common sense judgment about the transitions, and we have already used it to fine tune the algorithm uh, recommendations. And it, um, the data set is openly available for anyone who's interested um, in studying it further, and you can find it in our GitHub repository. Um, so this, um, I wanted to say thank you very much uh, for your attention, and happy to answer any questions now or also uh, after the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlis, for 
this is very uh, interesting uh, piece of work and a fascinating presentation. It's uh, very policy relevant. Um, I think it's now time for some questions. So I would invite you to post your questions in the Q&A and then I will give you the floor to, um, to ask your question directly. And perhaps in the meantime, um, one quick clarification question. So in the last um, slides that you uh, showed, looking at the similarity between the skill sets, um, you have different thresholds. How, how, how did you choose the thresholds? Um, yep. it that's, uh, that's a great question. And uh, at the moment, it's ad hoc. So. Kind of just by eyeballing and looking at um the it seems like the the dirt embedding similarity started to kind of deteriorate around the similarity threshold of 0 0.8 um when above it like the matches were really good and then below it kind of the matches become more random and so we kind of just set it there okay thank you that's also the feeling i had uh, looking at the yes. <laughs> uh we have actually one question uh from uh, Robin uh, Simpson. Uh, Robin, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you. I really like this work. I think, I think it's great. And thanks for the um, presentation. Um, so you're looking at potential transitions people can make between occupations based on the on shared skills. And I just wondered if there's any data that you've seen or aware of or, or research looking at the transitions that people actually make uh, in, in reality. And whether that sort of how that compares to the uh, to this work. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Ruben. Uh, that's a great question. And so I'm aware of uh, a data set that I think was used by researchers also from Oxford, which comes from the United States Current Population Survey. And there, I think it kind of captures around 400 occupations. So this is kind of a coarser level of granularity. And they're they're actually kind of um, you know they're doing survey of households and there you can see um, they're doing the survey I think um, with, like twice within six months uh, maybe I'm a bit unclear on the details but they're doing the survey twice and they can see whether uh, the job uh, code changed between these two surveys so this is one way and I think there's an equivalent data set also for perhaps for EU labor force survey. But, um, but, but one issue here is that um, like this is a really, really would be a really nice data set to use, but uh, the granularity there is um, kind of coarser. So as we kind of, and that, that makes me a bit hesitant because uh, as we saw, there's a, using this model from mapping career causes, you can see that there's quite a large variation even at the more granular level, you know, below uh, kind of the four digit level. But um, definitely like uh, getting some, Real real life transitions, either from these surveys or maybe from from CVs, would be something that is really really interesting, and I think would really complement both this kind of model based approach, as well as uh, the crowdsourced data that I just mentioned, which kind of looks more at the people's perceptions of, uh, of transitions feasibility. Yeah, that's interesting because so <clears throat> I'm the institute. I'm at the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, and one of the things we want to look at is. Um, comparing the sort of routes through technical education that we think people will make against, you know, the actual um, progression people make through different qualifications, and and we have data sets to show us that. And but but where we miss is when people go into education, go into work, and then come back into education at a later date. And there's a there's a gap there in terms of those career uh, paths. And in general, it seems like that's not that's not data that's readily available. I like the CVs idea. That would be. That'd be one way of getting at it, I guess. Yeah. LinkedIn has has all the data. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, if we don't have uh, more questions on the presentation itself, I would have one question on the uh, follow-up projects you mentioned. So you talk about the green jobs and green skills. Um, could you tell me more about what you mean by a green skill? Mm, yeah, um, I, I guess one of the goals of this project will be to also kind of um, narrow down and, and kind of converge on some more specific definition. But at the moment, the idea is to find jobs that are associated with uh, so-called green industries, which I, I think have been already kind of to some extent defined by, by the UK authorities. And um, 
and then find the skills that are associated with jobs that are you know in these green industries and then these would be the green skills okay thanks i think uh... Yes, indeed, it's uh, one of the challenge uh, uh, to define what uh, what a green skill is. Um, all right, so I guess it's now time uh, for uh, the coffee break. So uh, you can join the uh, coffee break uh, rooms uh, to uh, pursue the discussion. Um, thank you very much. Uh, to all of you uh, for uh, the discussion um, in this session. I think uh, it was very useful to uh, the three of us.